Uh, so, Lauri uh, from Minima, from Finland. Uh, I actually changed the headline also, uh, or title. Uh, we're getting some better results uh, learning to know the, the, the SMC models. So, so, we're at 16 microwatts now uh, for, for the AMA. But, how do you want to go to, to uh, double digit uh, microwatts for, for, uh, for a core? And the, the solution is, is low voltage, uh, ultra low voltage in this case. So, so you want to go down, uh, depending on, on what you exactly want to. Uh, do you want to uh, look at performance or, or the, are you not that uh, concerned about performance? So, so you might go all the way into sub threshold, uh, basically where the transistors are off, but still function as very good transistors. Or then you stay close to BT uh, and, and get more performance. And what you see on, on, on the screen now is, is uh, a, a performance per energy curve for uh, the SMC 40 nanometer. And, and for that, you see that, that you, can, you can hit still uh, good performance, you know, 10 megahertz to 100 megahertz in, in the 0 0.4, 0 0.5 range. Uh, this is a speculative architecture, uh, ADA44, so you can get uh, one gig at, at uh, the, the, uh, at the uh, uh, nominal voltages. And, and the, the thing that I usually point out in this curve is, is that uh, here where you're normally using your, your processor, you're actually at the law of diminishing returns. So, so if you look at the orange curve, the, the performance, and if, if you go from, from let's say 0.9 and 0.21, and, and you get very little increase in your performance. You've, you've seen that. You, you have to do a lot of stuff to, to crank out performance in your architecture. And at the same time, then, then you can have a 2x increase in, in your energy. Uh, but, but here at low voltage, you're actually the opposite way around. So, so the energy curve, the blue, is, is quite flat. But then by cranking out just a little bit more VDD, you can actually get a 10x easily improvement in, in your performance with only uh, less than 2x in energy. So, so in many cases, optimally, this is where you want to be. And, and with modern processes, uh, you know, 55 downwards, uh, you can really get good performance. You, know, you can do audio, you can do Bluetooth, things like that. But why do we not then see cores that, that can do this? And, and here, this curve pretty much gives you that. So please note the, the logarithmic uh, scale here. So, so this is uh, the variance of, of a few gates uh, in 65 nanometer, and, and the, the smaller processes are actually uh, worse on this. So, so uh, you will hit very large uh, values for, for uh, transistors. Now with long uh, logic paths this will average out, but it will mean that, that uh, you will have uh, a much more critical paths. And, and you can design very easily one core to no voltage, but designing uh, for yield is then another matter. So, so margins will hit you a lot. And what can you do? Well, you can take the, the cell library of, of a, a uh, 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 semiconductor provider, and you can redesign that, make it very robust, and, and you'll probably get a good result. I mean, there are companies. Uh, and and uh, that's good, but it will cost you a lot of time, a lot of NRE, and then when you go to another process, okay, you, you have learned much, but still it's going to be, again, a lot of NRE, and, and the smaller you go, uh, the more time it will take you. Or then you can then just do uh, margin, just do your normal synthesis and, and margin everything out, and you'll notice that uh, all the gains are gone. So what Minima proposes, and, and what we've been proposing for a while, while still on, on the academic side, is, is uh, do this margining adaptively. So uh, you design for, for nominal, for, for whatever point you're targeting at, at that 
one corner. And then when you hit your critical paths, I mean, whatever reason you hit them, uh, because you've actually hit a critical path, uh, but it also applies to voltage groups, uh, and also slow stuff like temperature, aging, uh, things like that. Then, then what you do is, is you give the, the circuit more time uh, to finish. So effectively uh, move the clock edge. Now, we presented this technology, so, so I'm not going to go too much into details uh, how we do this. Uh, effectively, uh, we use time borrowing and time monitors. So we uh, insert time monitors into uh, strategic places on the critical path. And then when we get hits uh, from those timing monitors, uh, we shift the clock edge. Uh, okay, there's a number of questions there, something like uh, one that uh, will come to mind is, is the feedback path that has to be uh, fast. Uh, uh, you know, we can hit that. Uh, and and uh, another question also is, is which critical paths. Uh, that's also something that we've, we've uh, done a lot of work in and to, to hit the exactly the, the right critical paths. But uh, the thing I want to stress here is, is that we're preemptively uh, looking at these critical paths. And, and when we do this uh, phase shift, we don't actually know whether this will be an error or whether it won't be an error. So it's preemptively. So you definitely don't want to be doing this uh, all the time. So I have a few examples and then uh, how, how we do this. Basically, you have to bring DBFS into play. Uh, and, and we've all also uh, done a lot of that DBF, so, so we have uh, the middleware that controls, uh, controls this. But in the end, effectively, what, what it comes to that, uh, no matter where you are, you know, are you at low voltage, somewhere in between high voltage, uh, you're uh, operating at that the, you're minimizing energy for that task. So uh, a couple of, of uh, examples on, on how this would work. Let's hope that these animations work. So, so voice wake-up is, is uh, a good use case, case for this. So, so the uh, smallest voice wake-up triggers uh, need uh, something around 10 megahertz, depending on your talking to. It might go a bit lower. Uh, some need uh, 15 to 20 megahertz. So uh, with 40 nanometer, uh, you can hit that easily with a good DSP at, at uh, 0.5 volts, where you're taking then around uh, five picatures uh, per cycle. So, so this is a very trivial case. You know, you're running your always-on voice trigger, uh, but to to uh, avoid false positives, then uh, you might want to run another trigger uh, at then. Uh, 0.9 volts uh, with a, a bigger memory memory footprint, and then you're taking taking uh, 40 picatures. But but without the, the very dynamic voltage scaling, you're effectively taking that that 40 picatures per operation uh, in in all cases. Uh, now the more interesting case is is what do you then do when when you want to optimize that your yield. And effectively, the same system uh, works there. So let's say that you're running a, a uh, Bluetooth LE, LE stack uh, at, at 64 megahertz. That might be overkill. 30 might be a 32 might be enough. And, and uh, now you have a bad check. So it's, it's your worst check uh, at your corner. So, so you're a bit higher at 0.7 uh, getting this uh, 64 megahertz. And then, then you finish your, your LE operation and, and uh, want to uh, quiet down for some housekeeping. So, so effectively, if your housekeeping is, is very low, uh, you'd be going you know, a few megahertz. And, and for 40 nanometer, you can hit that at the minimum energy point, you know, the, the lowest point at that curve. So, so you start to go down, but then uh, what happens is, is our interface, we start getting signals from that interface. So, so effectively, the hardware software interface, like, like you see on the, on the right there. So, so then you stop the DVFS, take a small step back, and, and effectively uh, then do your housekeeping at that 2 megahertz. Uh, but then you get no signals from, from our interface. 
Uh, this is effectively how the system uh, goes. So, so uh, there is a lot of lot of small details, uh, uh, like like the the uh, signal path to the clocking and things like that. I don't have the, those those circuits here uh, this time because this is more of a high level high level uh, case. But but so if you're a chip provider, what does that mean mean for your data sheet? Unfortunately, it's not our data sheet yet. You know, we have okay, we're not at that point yet. But, but uh, so if you want to use uh, this ultra low voltage, you're going to have very good good numbers at, at your typical cases. So they'll be five to ten x lower, depending on you know if, if at these few megahertz you're you're talking about ten x lower. Uh, but but uh, then at, at sixty four maybe megahertz, then then you're getting up maybe two x two x lower. But then. You'll hit a higher difference difference uh, here uh, in, in uh, the the uh, typical cases. Uh, the, sorry, the the uh, maximum cases and also the minimum cases. Even they're uh, they're not shown. So what does this end up when when you know you have these chips on the market? Uh, that's something I can't really say. It would be up to the uh, SOC providers to look at that. I mean, you can bin. Uh, or, or uh, then you can just leave it as is and, and see if, if anybody buys your chips. Uh, but so we've applied this technology now. Uh, unfortunately, no, no uh, measurement results yet as our chip hasn't uh, come back yet. Uh, so we're looking at now uh, 0.5 volts. Uh, this is just a very vanilla uh, R32 iMac. Uh, so we're looking at, at 16 microwatts for the core, uh, then uh, we won't hit the 15 megahertz that we're targeting here uh, for 0.5 at, at uh, corners, so, so the DBFS comes into play, uh, we'll hit it at about 0.6, uh, then 0.7 uh, we can hit 50 and at 0.9, 90 megahertz, going up to uh, somewhat below uh, 1 milliwatt. And, and uh, one more thing which I want to uh, go into before we go into questions is, is that uh, when minima technology is out there, uh, it should lead uh, to somewhat rethinking the system level. So everybody knows edge computing or, or uh, what uh, not name, uh, what other names it has. Uh, so that should probably become much more uh, attractive, but also looking at things like like uh, trying to reduce uh, memory usage even harder than people are doing doing now, because because if you're getting a 10x improvement in, in your energy, uh, you can do a lot more operations. Uh, memory is uh, effectively staying the same. So doing a lot more operations uh, to avoid memory accesses, to avoid uh, radio, uh, and and uh, that's something that we're all, all also looking at. We hope to have have some some ideas uh, for this uh, with our products. And, and finally, just to plug in a small commercial uh, at the end. So so we hope to uh, roll out an IP portfolio uh, consisting of of respite. Uh, audio and, and uh, small SPs uh, during this year. But that's about my talk. Oh, thank you and questions. I'm sort of curious how you do figure out where the critical path is because if there's a lot of device variation at very low voltage, a critical path on, on one particular chip could be very different on the next chip. And it seems to me in order if you have a lot of variation to deal with, you're going to have to exhaustively test every single path and every possible condition to know that you've got the critical path, or you've got to have an unbalanced design where one path sticks out. So how do you how do you deal with finding the particular critical path out of all of the possible paths to know that you really don't have a path that, that exceeds that? It, it comes down to to uh, looking at, at going into actually analog simulations and, and looking at really knowing what paths will hit that, then then using this with your synthesis, uh, this information and optimizing uh, the flow, you know, analog simulation 
synthesis and, and minimizing the, the uh, critical mass. But we're at about uh, 20 to 30 percent of the total but, mass. But this is a fab dependent issue. So you can't yes. do this in simulation because the variation given on any particular device, you know, you, you can do it in simulation. Right, but but the, the, you can't take the whole core. So that's something, that, you know, you can't put the whole core into what the cover uh, or not with. Because okay, so you're really just taking worst case possible passive. Yeah. Um, you, you raised an interesting point at the end there. Since you're operating outside of the characterized range of the cells, how did you get these power numbers? Did you do spy simulations and did you want to color the whole processor in order to get them? Uh, these, these are post layout, so uh, there will be some variance there until we get our first. So, so uh, to be honest, if this was SD, FPS, OI, I, I could give you very accurate numbers, but, but uh, since it's TSMC and we don't have our first chip yet, there will be some variance, so it might go back closer to 28, uh, and it might be 16 or, or be something in that range. But, uh, okay, somebody might say, you know, you're talking 2x, but I'm, uh, I'm saying uh, it's a few microwatts. So, but uh, by the time we roll out, then those numbers will be accurate. Is that good? Uh, my question is, uh uh, you, you, you use your own library or some uh, foundry libraries? And which of the uh, precise you use? Uh, is that the SOI or uh, the uh, We use the vanilla libraries. We do functional tests. Uh, you you store your own library? No. Vanilla uh, foundry libraries. Some library, okay. Yeah. Uh, we, we do add a few cells. But those cells are, are uh, more in the range of, of our monitors, uh, JTAG, things like that. Uh, but, but as to the gates, you know, the native gates, we don't, we do functional tests. But actually what I've noticed with, with these, I mean, if you look at old sub-threshold papers with 180 nanometers, there was a lot of talk on, on how many gates fail, especially XORs. Uh, actually, you don't really see that with these uh, smaller line, uh, line widths. Uh, now, I'm not a foundry guy, so, so I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly why, but I think what's happened is since, you know, there's variance and leakage issue with these, these uh, modern processes, the foundries have had to put a lot of time to make their uh, libraries better. Probably at 180, you know, they were just minimizing size. Now they're, they're really looking at that minimizing the variance. And, and then actually it benefits us also that, that those uh, gates actually function very well down to like 0.25. Um, perhaps your number uh, seems overkill the uh, link of the level. Uh, Can you repeat, please? I mean, the, your, your, your number for the DVS uh, sometimes uh, overkill the, um, the limit of the level. Uh, I mean the um, one, one five, uh, perhaps it's a, it's a, it's a, a don't support by the standard level. Uh, well, we've done the functional tests, so so we go through the whole library. So uh, we're not just you know taking the library and synthesizing it, and uh, so so there is a lot of work uh, involved before we start synthesis, uh, which is functional, but a lot of work. Okay. Uh, have to take some uh, have to be uh, positive also here it's we really optimized that process so so we're pretty fast on that and like I said we really don't see uh, functional problems in, in modern uh, vanilla foundry libraries <laughs>